Uh, if God really answers our prayers and provides grace to help us be better, we shouldn't be able to see that by just looking around. I mean, uh, you would think that uh, that would be pretty obvious. Uh, but the purpose of this talk is not so much to answer these questions as to show some data and post some questions and, and let you all mull over it and uh, come up with what you will. Um, I'm going to study the effects of prayer, the effects of grace. Now, in, in the Catholic Church, grace is a big deal. It's, more, it, it's uh, a, a little more, uh, um, I, can't, I can't say the word in my old age. It's, it's a little less specific in uh, other religions, but it's there. Uh, miracles, death experiences, demonic possession, and after. All I can do is get inside the mic. Is that better? Okay. Yeah, holler at me if things aren't going well. Apparitions of Christ's mother, which are really quite interesting. Uh, some examples might help elucidate the approach. Um, uh, apparitions of Christ's mother seem only to happen to Catholics. You know, you poor people out there who aren't Catholics, you don't have to get this. Demonic possession, however, seems to be very widespread in different religions and, and worldwide. Near-death experiences also seem to be universal. Um, uh, and such observations help us focus our thinking on the likelihood of such occurrences. There exists uh, data, uh, and here are some interesting facts, for instance, Pedophilia among priests, which is much talked about and has caused billions of dollars to change hands, um, seem to be uh, essentially percentage-wise the same as any other administrators, from the Boy Scouts to the Red Cross to all, almost any, you know, to schools and that. But divorce among Catholics who are married in the church is dramatically less than it is for the, the, the general population. Um, we're going to examine some of those influences. Um, there are three possible conclusions if the results are negative, if they show no obvious divine involvement. There's no God. And certainly there are many people who are only too happy to come to this conclusion and to beat everybody else over the head with that. You can't see that God does anything, so why do you believe? Now, God doesn't intervene, but... Um, in ways that are not apparent. He does it, but, but ways that are not really apparent to us. Uh, so lots of people will just get around the whole thing by saying, well, God knows what to do, you know. And he answered your prayers. He said no, and things like that. Uh, but then there's a God who does not intervene in human merit affairs in a dramatic way or in ways that we don't expect. Uh, you might come to the conclusion that uh, if God intervened all the time, it would be so apparent that there'd be no reason for faith. If the third is what's going on there, we have to modify our understanding of some of these things. There's good evidence that people leading, leading religious or very good lives have less stress and live longer. Um, and and there are, there's uh, some, some places that you can look up on the web to uh, see articles about atheism and suicide and such things. Um, However, this talk is not going to deal with that. We're going to deal just with the uh, subjects in which there is a direct interaction between uh, faith and the faithful, or people and, and the divine. Let's look at the efficacy of prayer. Do, do the sick who get prayed for get well better? Are there fewer accidents among travelers who are prayed for? Do, do fewer children become unbelievers or, or when they're prayed for by their parents? Um, and uh, I had a little joke about praying for the lottery. The, uh, the guy who had complete faith, complete faith that God was going to have him win the lottery. He'd tell everybody, I have complete faith. It's going to happen. And one night, a little bell rang, and the guy woke up and said, yes. And he says, it's the Lord. And he said, oh, yeah, I have complete faith that you're going to you know, have me win the lottery. He said, yeah, but meet me halfway on this buy a ticket. <laughs> uh, so there is this kind of questioning of, uh, of should we buy a ticket? Um, the 
Gospels are very clear. If you ask the Father anything in my name, he would give it to you. Paul is constantly telling the new church people to pray all the time. Just pray all the time. And we have a general belief um, that praying really is an important thing. We ask God to help out people. And uh, we all do that. Um, and then uh, here's a, a quote from a professor at the Luther Seminary that uh, these things are very complicated. So it's tough to sort that all out. Um, but science uh, can at least count. They can eat, at least look at numbers and they can look at types of people and things like that. Um, and there have been a lot of studies that have looked at the efficacy of prayer. You have people pray for the person and, and then other persons that aren't getting prayed for. And some people who are getting prayed for know it's happening and some don't. Uh, the largest study, uh, uh, which was, uh, I think, funded by the, uh, uh, I just love my memory, the, the Templeton Foundation. Templeton Foundation finds all kinds of really neat things on science and faith, and they're generally a faithful organization, so they funded this study. But there's many factors in doing this. You have all kinds of accidental biases and this and that. And then, of course, there's the question of uh, you're not supposed to test the Lord. And so the Lord may not, um, may not act the same way in your studies as he does uh, with other things. Uh, another review, what most of the, uh, the, the reviews, however, show that the, the prayer doesn't seem to do very much. Uh, sometimes it upsets the people and they have even worse problems because they know everybody's praying for them and that bothers them. Uh, there are uh, lots of critiques, of course, saying, come on, you can't do this. Uh, it's very hard to do. And beside, beside uh, uh, a guy is not going to play games with you. Uh, the psychological benefits of prayer may help reduce stress and anxiety all by themselves. Uh, other practices like yoga and tai chi and meditation do the same thing. So how is prayer better or worse? Maybe it's the kind of thing that people do. Um, but what, but one may call the results into question due to potentially biased samples. samples. Uh, but what we're looking for is not that. If you ask, if any of you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. We're not looking for, oh, yeah, the people who are prayed for were 1.36% more positive. No, no, no. All of them, or uh, a huge number of them. We're looking for a huge number. And uh, no matter what objections to the studies can be made, they can only be made uh, if you're expecting not very much of a result. But if you read the scriptures, you're expecting a pretty big result. Uh, social, somebody, social people continue to pray. Uh, there are several benefits, both from those praying and those receiving it. Um, in addition, the spirit uh, of the Lord helps those who help themselves uh, fits in here too. Um, my own personal thoughts, you have a problem of some magnitude. We believe that prayer can help someone. Uh, I certainly do. But then why are the results not so evident? Perhaps the prayers help those who pray. Uh, they certainly must help them a little. But perhaps a large amount of good in the world today is not to be expected. And rather, it is due to lives being changed by prayer. And so we take for granted the fact that the world seems to be a nice place, but maybe it wouldn't necessarily be that much. There's a lot of ways of thinking about that, and I'm sure at your tables you can do that. Uh, how does God respond to these studies? Uh, it would seem that a loving God would welcome our attempts to find out exactly what Jesus meant by this statement. But science can point us in a new direction that while praying for others, we understand its efficacy in probably a new way. And uh, we don't think God would have played games. I'm going to keep cause these people not to get together just to ruin the test that the Templeton Foundation is doing. God wouldn't do that. 
There are two responses to how creation works. There are probably more, but these two come to mind. The creator responds temporarily, temporarily to our requests, but often in ways we don't expect. This may result in a small statistical difference in, in outcomes in which some people get better, but not many because there's all kinds of other things going on. But the creator is responding. The creator does not interfere with creation on this level, but notes our faith in divine providence. We wouldn't get any difference at all then. God is not going to come down and reach in and make things happen just because you ask him. He's letting the world play itself out. And uh, prayer becomes an integral part of our faith in our, our community, but it's not causing God's fingers to come down and say, okay, you're healed and you're not. Um, let's look at grace. In the Catholic Church, grace is a big deal. Uh, it's the spiritual help you get by uh, participating in the sacramental part of the church. And the Catholic Church has seven sacraments, baptism, matrimony, holy orders, what have you. Um, the Eucharist and confirmation, you expect a general assist, something very, uh, very large, but not so specific. Matrimony, you'd expect fewer divorces. Holy orders, priests, you'd expect strengthening against things like pedophilia. It is not comforting that priests have the same rate of pedophilia as everybody else. You'd think that due to grace and their training and everything else, it should be a lot less. At least it's not more. Matrimony. Um, there are numerical evidence that marriages performed in religious settings are more stable than marriages not. Almost 50% of all marriages in the United States and 46% in Europe will end in divorce or separation. Among the same um, for Protestants, because uh, there's no real stigma uh, about uh, divorce among Protestants. But it's only 7% for the Jewish religion. We must, the rest of us must hang our heads. And only about 12% for Catholics. So is this grace? Is this, uh, and only Catholics get graves? Now, strong strictures against divorce among Catholics could explain an awful lot of this lack of divorce. Still, given the forces of modern society, we, we wouldn't expect such a dramatic result. The effect is easier to see among Protestants since there's no real against it. Bang, you're right up there with the population. Um, are we seeing grace for only your Catholics? Um, so the, the whole concept of how much grace affects what we're doing is very difficult to quantify, but it certainly raises some questions. The Eucharist, um, from the Greek, um, charis meaning grace and eu meaning well, or thanksgiving. Uh, this is accepted by most Protestants uh, uh, and Catholics and what have you, most Christians. Um, and it is practiced all the time. But of course, in the Catholic Church, we have this very strange thing. We think it's really God himself, Christ himself. Um, whereas um, in, even in, in some uh, Protestant denominations, they actually uh, just have grape juice because, oh, you can't have any wine. Um, but nevertheless, you would expect that kind of, of practice. Uh, uh, it's a central part of worship for the, for the uh, uh, Catholics, and you would expect the grace that followed from it to make Catholics uh, better than they would have been otherwise. Measuring the effect of effects of grace is very hard to do. Uh, but those who are receiving, but you could ask questions of those who are receiving Holy Communion. Do they spend more volunteer time than, say, atheists at food banks and, and uh, food, the help for the homeless, clothes, transportation? They certainly do all these things, but do they do it more? You would expect if grace uh, impelled them to do that, you would see it more. Atheists and agnostics certainly do a whole lot of that. And, uh, and, you know, they're not being affected by grace. So when you can do the numbers, you don't come out with anything very dramatic. It is true, however, religious organizations do seem to do more of this than other organizations. Uh, now, Catholics to receive communion have to be free from serious sin. And so that practice alone probably makes them uh, lean to being better people. Confirmation. 
that are practiced by both Catholics and some Protestant denominations. It's a reenactment of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes down and takes those apostles who had learned and gone for three years with Christ, but still didn't quite get it, and suddenly they got it. Um, that was a kind of grace for them. And the question is, does this grace obvious um, among uh, people receiving the sacrament? Um, uh, Protestants uh, seem to uh, ha have similar um, Pentecostal uh, ceremonies and this and that. It makes you an adult uh, religious person, what have you, but they don't believe that it has sacramental value. It's just a really good thing to do. Um, so it should make a sanctifying grace. It should make us better. It should make us uh, do all those things and be very much stronger and more knowledgeable in our faith. Again, it hasn't been possibly determined. It hasn't been possible to determine the effect of this. I don't know of any scientific study that could do it, although probably there is. Um, but it's another thing to think about. Holy orders um, is the Catholic word for people becoming priests, and it's called holy orders because there's a step. You're first the porter, that's the guy who guards the door of the church, and then the lector, that's the guy who reads the scriptures, then the deacon and the priest, and you step through those orders up. It's supposed to establish uh, with, with a high level of grace uh, the level of action and belief and, and performance of priests. So what about pedophilia? Um, well, once you understand that this is really a psychological disease, the church, Catholic Church first uh, made its big mistake when it thought that once the priest uh, uh, confessed and was sorry and said he wouldn't do it again, that it would go away, not realizing that this is a uh, uh, much more deeply ingrained thing and that couldn't happen. Uh, the church's big problem was that essentially they didn't want to know that grace wasn't working. And so they started covering it up. Very bad thing to do. Uh, so it's a psychological disease. Second, uh, if you look at the percentages, you see uh, that uh, it's a very complicated thing depending on the, the uh, exact uh, you know, do we have pedophilia among people who don't have that psychological disease? Um, uh, is it correlated with uh, psychological pathology? Such studies suggest that one or more neurological characters are present in all these things. And apparently grace isn't very good at overcoming these deep drives that are in our uh, psychology. Roughly 3% of the population have pedophilia, there's no evidence that Catholic prelates or uh, other ones are likely to be any more um, uh, struck by that uh, or be any more effective than other ones. Um, but as I say, it, uh, it, it's a small uh, uh, comfort to say, well, we're just the same as atheists because again, you're thinking grace should do something. Um, if the sacrament of holy orders confers grace, we're not seeing its effects in pedophilia. Miracles. Um, are miracles still happening? Um, what is the effect on the faithful? Um, did miracles happen in any other faith but Catholic Church, which requires two miracles for sainthood? We couldn't get two miracles for John uh, for uh, John the twenty third, so they they lifted that requirement so they could uh, make him a saint. Uh, must God ignore his laws of physics to reach in and change things in order to perform miracles? Or are they just normal, natural way, uh, ways that we haven't learned yet that God takes advantage of? Present day miracles. In the Catholic Church, there's a strong belief that miracles occur all the time. Uh, at Lourdes, there aren't many miracles. But when you we will be talking about Our Lady's uh, uh, apparition at Lourdes, she never promised any miracles. So the fact that there are any miracles at all is uh, um, something extra. Um, the common miracles our Protestants tend to cite is the number of people who are saved. They have this very special, deep uh, uh, interaction with the divine 
um, and they think of that as a miracle. How do many philosophers and theologians hold that whatever miracles are, we can't break natural laws? God has made those laws, and he's going to live by those laws. It's a little hard to explain changing water into wine. Islamic miracles today, uh, the Islamic uh, people have miracles uh, all the time. They all you can go on the web and find it out. But it's very interesting uh, what the miracles are. These are not miracles of healing or miracles of, you know, making a church stand up or something. They're just uh, miracles in which uh, uh, there is something, they'll cut up in a tomato and that will be the word for Allah, you know, or they'll see a tree in a particular shape. And uh, so they're all things, uh, uh, proofs of the existence of Allah. Um, in the Old Testament, there are many different types of miracles. It's parting of the sea, fire from heaven, manna from the desert. But almost all present-day miracles are about healing. If miracles were true, wouldn't we see other types of miracles? We don't see them. Just healing. Uh, it's nice, but uh, it does make you wonder if uh, we're not applying our idea about miracles from the Old Testament, from the New Testament to just uh, strange kinds of healing. Some, however, no matter how hard they're studied, uh, the church, for instance, the Catholic Church looks at all the proposed miracles at Lourdes, and they just knock them all down. They, they only have a handful, but they say, yeah, you can't explain these. These are just bone grosses, two inches in a day, and things like that. How about near-death experiences? Almost all over the world, this is a general thing. Now, um, you can, uh, that, that door swings both ways. You can say, well, um, that proves that, uh, that there is a heaven and, and people who die, some of them get uh, uh, given special information and then sent back to live better lives. But the other side would say, no, uh, if it's all over the place, irrespective of religion or belief or anything else, uh, that's a good, good argument for the fact that it might be due to something else. Um, and so you can go either way with that, depending on, on how you think about these. They're generally culturally determined. The experiences people have um, are with beings or with kinds of things that happen uh, that fit their culture. Um, uh, and so there have been more and more studies, and this, this very recent one in 2015, um, shows that uh, starving the brain for oxygen causes the memory to do a bunch of things. And it's not nearly as explicit as some of the stories that you hear people tell. And so from my point, uh, I have near-death experiences over here in the corner of my brain that says, uh, don't make a decision on these, just keep listening to what's going on. Um, but there are uh, lots of scientific studies that are now looking at how the brain does things, and uh, uh, we can't rule out that they aren't natural. On the other hand, we can't rule out that they aren't that miraculous. Uh, while these studies seem to show the mind does recap the life of oxygen and star brain, um, these reports, as I said, are often more detailed. You have brains, but brain, uh, dreams, but brain, dreams aren't the same as this at all. They're not nearly as logical. They're not nearly as structured. Um, and, and the question is, why are these reports so similar in content? Again, that door swings both ways. How about demonic possession? An analogy of possession comes from anecdotal accounts in the New Testament. The Old Testament doesn't have much on possession. It doesn't, it, it, it's not unheard of, but doesn't have much. But boy, we move far Christ around, you get the idea that you know, every hundredth person is possessed and he's constantly trying to get rid of them. And the disciples go out and come back and say, yeah, we were able to get rid of the demons. And so um, it's very uh, clear, at least the New Testament. Um, and uh, there are lots of examples of people who we think are possessed because of their very bizarre activity, but um, the, there's an extraordinary phenomenon that, that seemed to happen. They seem to suddenly understand foreign languages that they've never studied. They have incredible physical strength. They have knowledge of hidden, hidden things and 
in very uh, rare reports, there's been levitation where you've actually flipped up in the air. These aren't, none of these are explainable by science. Uh, such behavior seems to be uh, universal. And I invite you, if you're interested, to look up Wikipedia. It has a very comprehensive summary of all this. Um, in Islam, there's a thing called jinn, and, and it's uh, a, a being called jinn, which uh, has become our word for genie. Um, who interacts with humans, but not necessarily in, in a harmful way. Uh, in Mesopotamia, there were indications of demons and what have you. Uh, the Catholic Church, however, leads the way in treating apparent possession with spiritual exorcisms. You know, they hold the cross up and do all these good things. Um, and it turns out that they, uh, if you believe what you're hearing, most of those are very successful. Now well, that brings up a question. Uh, a recent comprehensive study looking at these races, demonic possession is, has a greater tendency to manifest itself in the female group. Uh, men don't seem to be possessed as much. Um, it, it, there's a juvenile tendency too, um, which tends to disappear with advancement of age. And there's a, uh, this particular study decided that South Central Italy had the statistically a lot more possessions than lots of other places, but they're all over the place, not just in Italy. Uh, and some uh, sort of demonic influence seems to occur in most religions. Present research demonstrates beyond a reasonable doubt that most of these are psychological. But again, as with near-death experiences and as with miracles, there are some that are very, very hard to uh, explain. But then you have to ask yourself some questions. I remember when they accused Christ of doing miracles because he was uh, in league with Beelzebub. And he said, why would I work? Well, why would I work against Beelzebub? A house divided itself against itself can't stand. And so you have to ask yourself, you're Satan and you really want to get people to leave belief in God. Would you scare them to death? <laughs> no, that would cause them all to run off and pray and do all kinds of things in hopes that they wouldn't be possessed. Uh, and why would only a subset of, of human beings be the ones that you bothered with? Uh, why wouldn't it be much more general? In, in almost all religions, and uh, even in Christianity, there's this dualistic, this, this war against good and evil. You ask yourself, why does God let uh, the evil Satan uh, do anything? Why does he let, allow him to come to earth at all? Um, and so the fact that there's this war going on seems to almost a holdover from Babylonian times in which good and evil are always having a war. Uh, Hindus do the same thing. Uh, the Hindus are, are really good because they, they have these righteous people and they go to heaven and they find out that the bad people are there too. <laughs> that really upsets them. Very good at wisdom. How about apparition of Christ's mother? It happens only to Catholics, but there have been hundreds over the last 2,000 years. Uh, the Catholic Church, again, looks at these and says, nope, 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 nope. You know, when you see a picture of uh, the Blessed Mother in a tortilla, that uh, doesn't, doesn't cause a lot of excitement. Um, they recognize only a handful, and I'll be discussing Guadalupe and Lourdes and Fatima. They're quite impressive, and aspects have, uh, of, of them have been seen by hundreds. About half in the 19th century were in Europe. Others, however, were worldwide. They most have often appear to children or people not familiar with religion. So when the children say, well, the Blessed Mother said this, they're saying things that they normally wouldn't know. Uh, and what would be the purpose of Our Lady uh, coming back to Earth? Now, keep in mind, uh, there's a, a large belief, especially among Catholics, that she was assumed bodily and soul into heaven. And so she would have a, a much uh, different uh, aspect in order to be able to do that. 368 were reported um, uh, in the 20th century. The church accepts eight, four, four in Europe, one in Egypt, Philippines, Venezuela, and Japan. Okay, let's take a look at this. 1531, Our Lady Guadalupe. We here in New Mexico know the tremendous devotion that Catholics have to Our Lady Guadalupe. Um, I will tell you that my reading of Our Lady Guadalupe is that she didn't just come down to tell people to pray and be nice. Um, when the uh, Europeans discovered the New World, uh, first of all, the New World wasn't in the Bible. 
It wasn't in Aristotle. And so they wondered if these beings that they were running into had, who had such strange uh, uh, customs were, um, they wondered if they were really, uh, did they have souls? Were they really humans? And people who wanted to exploit them for labor were only too happy to say, no, they don't. And the priests were trying to convince people, no, they probably have souls. It took Our Lady about 30 years to send one of them, a Native American, to a bishop to tell a bishop what to do. End of discussion. Now, so the, Our Lady of Guadalupe, from the, the Catholic point of view, was the uh, interaction of the divine to give us one piece of information. No, they have souls. They, they're just as human as are. They go to heaven or hell. They, you know, you can't exploit them. Um, here's an early description, um, 16 page manuscript, all the way back to 1556. Um, um, but the bishop, Juan de Zumarga, uh, never mentioned it. He did a lot of writing and everything else, but he never mentioned it. So we have an account, which is right the same, same years that it happened, or 10, 10 or 15 years after, and a bishop that it happened to who never mentions it. And he could say, well, he was a little embarrassed to get told by some peasant what to do, so he didn't bring it up. Um, now, um, the one thing, the peasant cloak showed up to have that famous uh, painting of uh, Our Lady, which you've seen uh, in, uh, in the old 18th century churches around here. And they've studied that because it's not a painting. In fact, the studies that they've done, there isn't any really well-known source of what could have put that on the, on the cloak. So that's an interesting piece of information. In 1858, there were some young girls and they were at this grotto and they saw this really pretty lady and she told them to do things, but she called herself the Immaculate Conception, which is the belief that Mary, was, because she was gonna be the mother of God, was born without the failings, the original sin, or the, the, the tendencies to sin that everybody else was. And she called herself that, and the, the children didn't really know what that meant. Um, and a stream of water started, um, and uh, there, you know, now millions of people go there every year, and uh, it's almost become a carnival because outside of where it was, they have to push it back. There are people selling everything you can buy dolls and t-shirts and all kinds of things. Uh, and the number of miracles is very rare, but the influence on the faithful seems to be very powerful. 1917, we're in the middle of World War I, and these uh, kids in Fatima have a, a same kind of thing. They're hearing this lady and she's telling them things. Um, and at one point she says, she tells them, I'm gonna appear on this day and we'll have something. So thousands of people show up and they, most of them, not all of them, say they saw the sun do all kind of crazy things, which the sun doesn't really do. Um, and there's sort of photographs of that, but they weren't movies, and so you can't really tell. But she gave three secrets uh, to these uh, children, and the first two secrets had to do with the end of World War I and the, and the conversion of uh, Russia. The third secret was uh, um, uh, much more complicated, and the churches not made a big thing of that because it's, it's a lot of nice words, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so what would be the purpose of Marian's apparitions? One scenario, Christ allows freedom to people and enters history to give revelation, but people can do whatever they want. And in our case, our civilizations starting uh, in about the uh, 19th century started to lose faith like crazy. And these apparitions may be a gentle way of Christ's mother nudging people back to the faith. Her messages are always really wonderful, loving, giving, good living. And so, uh, in, you know, whether we believe in them or not, they certainly uh, are in the right direction. Uh, summing up, in all these cases, scientific studies generally find other causes for most, but not all of the phenomena. In short, God's intervention in everyday life seems limited. Yet there's a common uh, acceptance that God does intervene in certain circumstances in a personal way to people. Each has some scientific explanation, but presents problems that science can't explain. 
Here we have an interesting and perhaps disconcerting intersection of faith and science. Science can look at things and say, how come they only he happen over in Europe? How come they only happen to women? In other words, they can do a count of the kinds of things which make you wonder what's really going on, if anything at all. Uh, clearly, there's room for more focused studies. Um, but regardless, we need to modify our understanding of our interactions with God in a way that preserves our faith in a caring, providential God, but takes into account the subtle interactions and methods of the divine. Thank you. What was it? Two years ago? Maybe. <laughs> Three. Two years ago, Susan and I gave a talk on near-death experiences. And there are, it's a really interesting area. Susan actually had a near-death experience. So I think two of them. She talks about that. Um, there's a lot that we don't understand. However, being deprived of oxygen doesn't, and I just mentioned this, I'll just emphasize it, it doesn't really answer the questions associated with near-death experiences. Anybody who's interested in that can talk to Susan or I. So actually my question, actually it's multifold. I believe that the Holy Spirit is involved in humanity. And so the question is, if that's true, and the Holy Spirit is involved in each Christian, then God is involved in the world right now in many different ways. And you could imagine that in terms of making decisions, could be involved in that, but you can imagine it in many, many different ways. Um, so that is one aspect of God and the involvement that I've always wondered about. And I've had some experiences that are strange for me. The other thing, Chick, that I find interesting when you're talking about situations where Mother Mary becomes important to a person, I've talked to people who have visions but not of Mother Mary, but of situations where there is tragedy and the person has an image, for example, the child that has died or a mother. And so that would be another thing that I'm really curious about you know, are images just associated with Mother Mary, or are they actually a lot more common than, you know, we talk about? A lot of people aren't willing to talk about those images. So, enough. Uh, well, I, I think that Glenn's absolutely right. Um, and I think I made that point that uh, the Again, you, instead of having either or, you might have both and. A lot of near-death experiences might be just due to brain starvation, but not all. A lot of miracles might be due to uh, uh, people misrepresenting what they're finding. And so there is the, uh, the, the way out is the easy way. And, uh, and uh, so uh, I think that uh, continue thought about these things and study uh, may tell us what uh, quantitatively what fraction that is. I would expect all the ones that have no obvious explanation to be pretty rare. Here, um, Chick, you refer to what Jesus said in John 15, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. But soon after that, Jesus prayed three times not to have to go through with the crucifixion. Yet God's answer was apparently no. 
Also, Paul prayed three times for the thorn in his flesh to be removed, but God said no. So if our prayers sometimes seem ineffectual, it may be that they run counter to what God has decided is necessary. I agree with that, uh, but I will point out something uh, a little interesting. Uh, the uh, agony in the garden is a very special time. The apostles are all asleep. So who knows what happened there? How did anybody know what Christ did? Or was that made up? Other questions? Uh, other qu These are good questions. Um, Eric Firm asked, do other religions, non-Christian, have things similar to the Lady of Guadalupe or Lourdes? Well, it depends on what you mean by uh, have things similar to, but I think that uh, seeing meaningful visions uh, with more than one person, the nice thing about these, these was uh, they all happened to more than one person. It wasn't just somebody saying, oh, I saw, you know, da-da. Uh, I think those, if they occur, I don't know any, any of them. So they're probably pretty rare, but it's a good question. Uh, Ted had a question back there. Just say it and I'll repeat it. Loud. Okay, Ted, you do need to come up. Okay. They are worried that, well, it's, it's best to do this. Close. So the question I'd like everyone to think about is, um, Basically, since about the 1920s, this will be about 100 years, um, uh, physics has changed from what Einstein wished, was, which was a very deterministic universe uh, based on actually a Jewish philosopher called Sp Baruch Spinoza, who lived 400 years earlier. So beginning in the 1920s, we encountered uh, experiments that we had to model, which really disturbed Einstein's love for determinism, uh, which bears on miracles, I think, because uh, what do we make of phenomena in, in our religion uh, like superposition of quantum states, entanglement, and so forth. I'd like everybody to think of that a little bit. Also, it does seem that perhaps many things can be happening simultaneously. As you know, that's one interpretation of quantum mechanics dating from the 1950s. Hugh Everett at Princeton. Of course, that's very controversial, but you can look up on the internet these things, and perhaps all our laws, God's laws, are really meant to be, uh, to some extent, uh, statistical. And that doesn't, that doesn't rule out miracles because miracles is just something very unusual. We say it's very improbable. But if we're going to be strictly quantum mechanical, not impossible. So just comment on that. Uh, of course, whenever people bring up the indeterminacy of quantum physics, which is a real fact and, and very powerful, and by the way, there's no real philosophy of that, um, other people object and say, well, that's on the micro, micro, micro level. Um, but the statistics of all these things happening, uh, by the time you get to the macro levels, the three little children looking up uh, in a grotto, um, the, the things are not indeterminate anymore. Uh, nevertheless, I think uh, Ted makes a good point that we shouldn't rule that out of our thinking. Um, why am I not surprised? <laughs> why would Jesus make up a story that God denied his prayer right after saying the Father would grant anything we ask? And then he followed that with, or anyone else for that matter. Um, I'm saying Jesus didn't make it up. 
Uh, there's another one where the, the temptation in the desert, who saw that? Who knows what happened? And so you have to ask yourself, in these cases, uh, there is at least uh, a subject worth discussing in which these are uh, the only two I know in which uh, no one observed what happened and yet it's recorded. Uh, and so you begin to look at uh, what was the purpose of the, the gospel writers. Now, you know that I don't comment on people's presentations, but you know, uh, I think there's plenty of discussion points that we should uh, have fun with at the tables as we continue for the next 45 minutes or half hour. And I'll have to say that um, with all the brilliance that's in this room, I want to know how you turn water into wine with all those witnesses. And, um, and Glenn, yeah. <laughs> but um, I also, uh, we have these wonderful questions at your table, but I would also like you to discuss the possibility that a miracle when we're talking perhaps healing, if we want to limit it, is just a speeding up of the laws that we think are in effect these days, speeding up the healing, speeding up things that can occur. Um, it seems very simple to me, um, but then again, I'm not brilliant, you know, I'm just, you know, but anyway, please enjoy the next few minutes. Chick will wander around to each one of your tables as time allows, and we will discuss the topics that he has put forth. Thank you. One other comment to Ted Fye's remark. Um, if you are interested, uh, ask me how I explain how there can be three persons in one God from a quantum mechanical point of view. Thank you so much.